I'm on. I'm good. Right. Ready to go. Well, nothing everyone else has to do with me today. We're going to be moving quickly, so Chris, get ready. I'm on it. <laughs> That's right. I'm Teresa Hunsaker, uh, formerly with USU Extension. I'm in, signed in. Um, I am retired now, but they still allow me to go out and teach classes. I teach a number of them in the community. And today we're going to be talking about what about Ken and combining that with people. So, Chris, next slide. The very first thing that I want to address is just some real basics on water bath canning first, and then we're going to go into pickling because I usually get a lot of questions on this, so you guys be thinking of your questions. One of the first things that I just, and some of you were in the class last time, and so you know this, there are scientists who test recipes specifically for optimum safety. So we get that. Well, what are they looking at? What's determining the times and the temperatures for the canning that we're doing. And I'm speaking specifically of canning right now, okay? So what they're looking at is the acidity level of the food. They're looking at the food density. How thick is it? How fast is the heat going to penetrate to kill any microorganisms or pathogens, right? So they're looking at the density. Then they're looking at the starting temperature of the food. Are we going raw fat? Are we going hot fat? So the starting temperature of the food is going to make a difference as to how long it needs to be subjected to the water bath or to the steam canner, or if we were pressure canning in the case of pressure fan, which we'll talk about coming up, I think, our next class. Um, then we're looking at the size of the jar. Is it a half pint? Is it a pint? Is it, you know, a two quart? What, what is it? A quart? So all of those things matter. Then we're looking at the altitude or elevation. All right, what happens the higher you get in elevation to the boiling point of water? It decreases, right? So at sea level, it's 212. Here on a typical day, it would be around 204, 203. So the temperature is less. The water is less hot. So what we call the microorganism kill isn't as effective as it would be if it were at 212 because some microorganisms like and can survive, in other words, in hotter temperatures than less hot temperatures, right? So the starting or the elevation of the altitude. And then we also test for what's called the standard bacteria load. What would be most likely of the microorganisms and possible pathogens to be in the jar of food? From the kitchen, off of the field, hopefully washed clean, all of those things. All right, so that, that's what we're looking for. Thanks, Chris. So in the case of water bath canning, we are looking for high acid foods in order for them to be water bath canned or steam canned. And we're using these interchangeably. And I'll talk about the equipment in just a second. All right. So let's look at this kind of pH chart, the potential hydrogen, which unless you're a food scientist, you don't care what pH stands for, you just need to know it has to do with acidity, okay? So what's considered neutral is seven on a pH scale from zero to 14. Very acidic up at zero, like would burn you if it touched your skin, immediately burn you, down to 3.2, like lemon juice, down to 4.0, like some tomatoes, down to five, point all like onions on down to what would be something considered very alkaline or very basic, right? And that would burn you too. Uh, so I'm at 14. Okay. So neutral is about seven, like water. Okay, and milk would be about there as well. So what we're looking at is what foods and their pH or their acidity level are still safe for water bath canning because microorganisms don't like a certain acidity and that will kill them. So that cutoff for regular cooking temperatures, like boiling water and the acidity combined is a 4.6 pH. So if a food has 4.6, 4.5, 4.0 on up to a lower number, higher acidity, okay? Next slide. So as we look at this, then let's look at some very specific foods. And again, some of you saw this last time. This, this is just a review. So we're looking at a 4.6 as our cutoff for something that can be water bath. 
and the lower the number, the more acidic it is. Remember I said lemon at 3.2? That's a lower pH number, but it's a higher acidic food. So I can can or bottle anything from 4.6 all the way up to something like lemons or oranges or you know, if I wanted to do my own mandarin margin, I could, right, in a bottle bath together. But that also includes other fruits and other foods like pickles, because pickles have acidity. Now, I could just do a cucumber because a cucumber is down to 5.4, 5.3, something like that, right? So that would have to have acidity added to it. Or I would have to ferment and get acidity again. I'll talk about that in just a second. So, guys, when you get questions about water bath canning or the steam canner, it can only be for what we would consider high acid foods, 4.6 or higher in acidity, lower your pH number, right? So when people are pickling, they have to make sure that they're getting the right acidity in those carrots and cucumbers and onions that they've got all mixed up in a relish, let's just say, right? They can't just be messing around with their own option. Yeah. Is there a place that sells acidic strips? There are science uh, shops, chemical places that you can get food grade pH strips or readers. Yeah. The most accurate is an actual wand. It's a digital wand that's a pH meter. It's only about $100, just under $100. Works very effectively. That's what we use at the extension office when we want to get really close and very accurate on some of our pH numbers. But a pH strip is going to be, especially if it's in very small increments, like 3.4, 3.2, 3.0, you know, that kind of thing. So that it's real close in pH numbers uh, for reading the color. So, but yes, you can do that. Yeah, and they're available. You can get them. There's a place in, call, in Salt Lake called Third Works that you can get the digital pH reader as well as the pH strips. Okay. Um, even up here, um, Weber State's chemistry department will sell food grain pH strips. These they used to. So, okay, good question. So we do want to do that. We don't want you playing scientists in, in your own kitchen. That's why we give you tested recipes. That's why we always will move you to USDA's books or Ball's um, canning books. And this isn't the only one, but one of their standard canning books. Um, our, our three choices are National Center for Home Food Preservation, which is out of the University of Georgia, Atlanta, USDA, home. That's that's really where we go to with our food science um, testing. Okay, so that makes sense, right? Now, when we talk about salsa, what am I adding to salsa besides tomatoes? Onions and peppers, right? Some people throw in a little zucchini because they've got a little extra or whatever, you know, that is different than zucchini. That poses a problem because zucchini, carrots, onions, peppers all fall below in their acidity the 4.6 line. All right. So now, how come I can I can water bath salsa? Well, because I've either added lemon juice or vinegar. So almost all tested recipes for water bath canning or steam canning are going to be vinegar or lemon juice added or citric acid. Okay. All right. Thanks, Chris. So, yes, oh, thanks. Quick question. Sure. Uh, asking um, where you were getting the name from. Therm Works. That right? Therm Works. T H E R M Works. Capital W O R K S. And they are in solid. Yep. And they're around $100. Okay. So, yeah, guys, shoot questions from. from down your way, no problem. Okay, so high acid foods, 4.6 or lower in number, higher in acidity can be water bath. Anything 4.6 or bigger in number, less acidic, has to go into the pressure cap, which is another class next week, I think. All right, thanks, Chris. So when we're looking at the, now we're going to high acid, we're looking at a recipe for jams, jellies, pickles, or whatever. And, and it tells us that we have 
I ask them, well, water back can. Are we starting with sliced peaches, hot water over the top of them? Or are we pre-cooking those apple slices? That would be a hot cap if it's pre-cooked, simmer for a few minutes. Just taking those fresh green meat, well, that green meat is a good example, that's fresh again. But those fresh sliced peaches, those fresh cherries, and just putting hot syrup over, that's called a raw cap. I haven't done anything to pre-cook those pieces of fruit, whatever they are, all right? So raw cap, hot cap will affect the processing time. Okay, so you'll see that difference. You'll say, well, wait a second, this says 35 minutes, but that says 45 minutes. What? Well, it's because maybe one was hot back, like the 35 minutes, and the other one was a raw back. So you need to read through the instructions really carefully, not just go straight to the recipe, the ingredients, and assume now you know what to do. All right, so make sure that you're looking at raw pack versus hot pack. Okay. I like a hot pack on a lot of things because I get a better feel, less bubbles, better color, texture, retention is actually longer on the shelf than with the raw pack. But for going through three bushels of peaches all at one time, I'm like, I, I don't want to hot pack all those peaches, right? Okay, thanks, Chris. Okay, sure. If you're going to hot pack, how long do you cook? Just a simmer of three to five minutes, sometimes 10, depending on the food and whether or not I need to cook it a little bit longer for a flavor blend or that kind of thing. But most like peaches, it's three to five minutes simmer. So not very long. If you put peaches in hot water just so you can get one better? That doesn't count as a hot okay. pack. Okay. So the question, I don't know if they could hear it, was if I am wanting to peel my pears or my peaches. Uh, my tomatoes and I put them in a blanch of a boiling water because that can't pop up and it does not. That's just to slip the skin step. Okay. All right. Okay. So what we're looking at then from the food scientist standpoint is the increase in time for elevation and sometimes the increase in time for water bath that's a raw path. But right now we're looking at just altitude or elevation. What am I adding? So for a water bath canner, these are right here, steam canner or water bath, because these are interchangeable, okay? At for add two minutes for water bath canning for every thousand feet above sea level. All right, so here's your test. Weaver County is 4,500 uh, elevation, okay? 4,500 feet above sea level. So how many minutes am I going to add to the recipe for peaches, let's just say, or my pickle relish or whatever? Add this, yeah, nine minutes. So typically we'll just round up to 10 and a lot of the charts will even be in five or 10 minute increments. But that's, the, in effect, that's really what I'm looking at, right? So I'm increasing by minutes or time for a water bath canner as I increase in elevation above sea level at two minutes per thousand. Now, pressure canning we'll talk about next week. You're going to add pounds of pressure. So we're not even going to address that. So we'll move on and we'll talk about that next time. All right, so more pressure for the pressure canner on low acid foods, more time on water bath or steam canner. And these are the very same. I don't change anything. It's nine minutes here, it's nine minutes in a steam can, okay? All right, so now let's talk about this equipment for just a second. There are a number of different pieces that I can use if I don't have this standard, what we're normally used to as a water bath canner. I could actually use the base of my pressure canner and not up down the lid, because I want something that will hold at least my quart with at least an inch of water over the top of it, all right? So, and our ideal is two inches. Well, that's easy to achieve with a pint jar or a half pint jar, but it isn't so easy to achieve with a quart jar or a two quart jar if I were doing apple juice, let's just say, okay? So, we're looking for good standard tanks or 
bins that will hold sufficient water to cover my jars by at least an inch of water, or what we call equal heat penetration all the way around. Because the surface of the water is going to be cooler because it's not subjected to the heat source down here, even though the water may be moving and rolling, right? So that's going to cool faster. So we want at least an inch for that even heat penetration all the way around that jar. All right, so now what about the steam can? The other option is the steam canner. We have finished testing with the steam canner um, across the nation, and it is equally sufficient. And I'll show you a slide in just a second. I still make the elevation or altitude adjustment here, but I am not submerging this in water. This is a dome that sits over. So in order to convert water to steam, is the temperature uh, needing to be hotter or can, is it going to be equal, or is it going to be cooler? The steam that's building up inside this dome from boiling the water in the trough below. It's about the same temperature, a little bit hotter in the steam in terms of the actual temperature that it's subjecting uh, those bottles to. But we don't account for that. In order to convert, the hot boiling water to actual steam and maintain it as steam, it's actually just a little bit hotter, okay? All right, but in order to convert, it's, initially it's gotta be the same. You know, boiling is the same, 203 or 204 or whatever, okay? But steam is actually just a little bit hotter itself. Okay, so now, with that in mind then, I've made my elevation adjustments in the processing time because I'm eight degrees, nine degrees less in temperature, right? So now either one of these is fine. This dome has to be left on. I want the steam of plume uh, or the plume of steam to be coming out. There's a little vent hole. I don't know if you can see that it's about a quarter of an inch, maybe not quite, here on the side. Uh, maybe if I hold it up. Well, anyway, it's there, I promise. So I want a plume of steam to be coming out of that, all right? I don't want to lift this part with you. I know the temptation is, oh, what am I doing, right? When you do that to your water bath canner, no, you, you leave that lid on as well because that's a, that's a change in temp and pressure and I'm letting all of that steam out. That's why a lot of people have loved it and converted to the glass lid. Um, steam or water bath camera because I could at least see and, and kind of, you know, for those of us that have to look. Um, I have a light and an oven with a clear glass door on it, but do I still take the door down to check my cookies? Yes, I do. It's just natural, you know, human nature, but we want to leave the lid off, okay? I also am um, going to use standard candy jars and yes, Ball, Kerr are one and the same. They're made by the same company now. If you could even find Kerr ball, bottles, you won't be able to. But um, there's also other standard mason canning jars that are available. And you'll want to use standard canning lids and rings as well. Okay, Check for chips, cracks. Um, I pulled one container of quart jars out and one of the quart jars had a dent in it. I should have brought it, it literally on the side, they don't break next time, um, had a dent is in water now. I, I would probably use four and definitely high acid foods. Um, but again, these are another option available and a lot of people especially like to put their pickles or their relishes in these Kilmer jars. All right. Um, the tap of lid that I was referring to, I'm just going to mention briefly. That lid is um, and has not been tested by USDA, but we know that through its use, we had a lot of success, but we also had a lot more seal failures. And it's a lid that has the kind of the rubber gasket ring on it, and the lid itself is is a polyester nylon lid instead of a metal lid. And it's very difficult to tell if it is sealed. One year in our Master Food Preserver class, 
we use those tattlers for an entire batch of jams and jellies, and not one of them sealed. Now, last year, I used them for a number of different water bath option jars. Not I mean, we didn't use them in pressure jar, and all of them sealed. So we're wondering if the shorter processing time on jams and jellies wasn't quite sufficient to keep that sealing compound rubber gasket kind of uh, ring that's also used similarly in the Tatler uh, lid, if that just wasn't sufficient to soften it to pull a good seal and that was the problem. But USDA has not completed the research so it's not that we're saying don't use them. We're saying we haven't tested them on a wide and broad basis to feel comfortable in recommending. Make sense? All right. And then there's a number of other tools that are also really helpful. Obviously, a jar lifter. Um, I love my headspace um, measurement tool. This is also a deep bubbler. I can use this in for getting the bubbles out. It's a heavy duty. Um, plastic that makes it really nice, but this end has my increments for the, um, the depth of my, uh, how, much I say? How, how full I'm filling my jars, my head stays. And then there's also a magnetic lid lifter to get it out of some hot water if I want. All right, so those are some of my uh, basic tools for water bath can. All right. We got it too. Okay, so let's go to the base. I've got at least a counter that's enough to hold enough for one inch of water. Some of these are large enough to hold seven quarts or definitely seven pints. I definitely like to have the rack in the bottom to be able to lift and lower the jars into. So I set my jars as I get them full onto the rack, and then I can just drop that down in. Now, if you don't have one of these, you can get replacement uh, for them here at Smith & Edwards. You can also use a cake rack. You just have to use your jar lifter to set it down into, which is fine. You don't have to have the handles on it. But some people will use a cake rack as a replacement. And others will use the rack that's inside their pressure canner which again doesn't have the handles, um, but it's another option. I just don't want the jar sitting on the bottom of the canner next to the heat source, immediately next. I want that space in between. And then I need to have something to cover. Another fun thing about some of these is that they have an elevation guide that lets you know when you're in the right zone and it, and it reads the atmospheric pressure with the steam or the water that's boiling to let you know that you, you know, to a place where um, you can now start your timing, which is kind of nice to have zone blue and zone yellow and zone orange. But anyway, uh, so those are kind of handy. Okay, moving on then. Steam canners. There are a couple of little nuances with the steam can that I just wanted to remind you of. For Anything that has a water bath time of 45 minutes or longer, such as, um, <clears throat> let's see, what would have raw pack tomatoes, 90 minutes in quarts. Okay, so raw pack, no liquid added tomatoes, or 90 minutes at this altitude. The water in this trough will boil out and dry in 90 minutes. So that's why we've gone to 45 minutes. The water is only about this deep. So when I'm creating steam, I'm boiling off the water. So that's one of the big ones. Definitely, as a reminder, high acid foods. Don't lift the dome, as I've mentioned, that big plume of steam coming out the side. And then um, I like to, on both, I will just mention this, once the time is up, I like to gently burp the lid. I don't know how else. I don't just immediately turn off the heat and immediately pull my jars out of the cap. And I don't totally lift this off and then immediately pull my jars out of the steam cap. How many of you have uh, been to Bear Lake in like two? 
and you're thinking, okay, it's a nice ambient 85 degrees outside of Bear Lake. So you just jump right into the lake to go water skiing. But the water is so cold still in June that you suck air and kind of rise. It's the same kind of principle here. We have created this nice, hot environment. And as soon as I start pulling the lid and lifting jars out or releasing all of this steam immediately out of this dome, I have subjected these jars to the tendency to suck air or siphon. All right, that's exactly what I've done. Just like when I jump into Bear Lake in the first part of the season, I'm like, Whoa. Right? Same thing here. So out comes the bubbles up under the ceiling compound that I just softened in order to pull a seal. And now I've got sugars and syrups and particles and pieces of starch foods and all up underneath the ceiling compound because it literally is sucking the air up, out, and through, which is what I wanted it to do, but I wanted it to do slowly so it didn't siphon the liquid out of my jars. So that increases the potential for it, but not so little. So I burp, I'm gentle, I let this rest, and in all of the ball books now, they all say, let your food rest five minutes before pulling it out. You will have so much less siphoning and you won't have near the problems with jars, not sealing. And that goes the same place in camp. Okay, we've already mentioned standard candy jars. I think we can move along on that slide. Uh, the lids, again, want to make sure that I'm finger tight on getting the ring and the lid in place. No tighter. Um, you'll get buckling and tucking in that metal lid. Uh, and that can cause a, kind of a false seal. All right. Um, also, one other thing. I'm lifting the jars up, out, and on to my cooling towel or wrap or something. I'm not tipping the water off. Again, well, as soon as I tip that jar, I've now created the potential of sealing compound not being you know, intact because I put the liquids up underneath it. Um, and then I also, you will notice that the rings will loosen. Don't readjust those rings. Don't tighten those down. Don't readjust the lid. Just you lift it up, out, and on, and let it cool on its own. Your first tendency will be one. Drain the water off the top and second, tighten the ring. I, I, I've seen it in my classes for years. Okay, so don't do that. All right. Um, this is just kind of a steps. Start slowly, especially your first batch. Um, you don't want to add raw pack peaches to this hot, bubbly mass of water. Okay. I want in between batches even to temper. I want it to, that's why we're going to rest. That glass shock that can happen on raw pack products more so um, will have bottle breakage. And so we want to have you have success. So start slow, make sure the water isn't boiling any longer from one batch to the next. Um, make sure to even use hot, hot syrup, hot, hot boiling water. That's what you're putting over your peaches or you know, whatever you're doing, not not room temperature syrup or water. Um, start, you can start kind of slowly heating that up. I know it's going to frustrate you because it's going to take longer. You've got three bushels to get through. I get that, but you will be happier in the end with the product overall than try to force and, you know, have it as hard and you boil and all of those kinds of things. So just again, just slow and low. Keep it, keep it going. Um, as long as it's breaking the surface. All right. Okay. You heard me talk about this last last time. I'm going to kind of quickly move over this, but we're going to select good quality food. We're going to follow the recipe. You're going to sterilize jars if the processing time is less than 10 minutes. Well, we don't have anything really at this elevation that's less than 10 minutes, so you don't have to sterilize jars. Did you know that? You do not. Now, jams and jellies, if it was a five minute processing time, then I would need to sterilize the jar. Okay, but everything else, I, as long as my jar is clean, which is one of those myths that a lot of people don't know. Um, process for the correct amount of time. 
definitely wipe down the rims, get the air bubbles out. Those are all steps that you guys probably already know, but they're important, especially to siphon. The more um, air bubbles that you don't get out, uh, the, the more problematic it can be for siphoning those liquids out. Those, those big packets of air bubbles will cause a problem with the siphoning as well. Um, filling the jars, making sure that you get a good feel but not overpacked, and make sure you're getting the bubbles out is also part of this whole process. All right, a fourth of an inch of headspace for jams and jellies, a half an inch for fruits, pickles, and tomatoes, and low acid foods in a crusher canner is going to be one to one and a fourth inches. The only exception to that one to one and a fourth inches for water bath food is pie filling. High filling the starch that we use, the uh, clear gel that goes in the high filling is so expandable with the moisture in the food that an inch to an inch and a fourth is the one exception to the half an inch for most fruits. Okay? Right. Definitely test your seal. Um, don't force the seal down as you're testing it, but you can see that it's concave. The cool thing about ball is that it has this nice little extra button at the very top. So when it's concave, that little button goes down and the, the lid is a concave lid with that button down. So when you come up here at the end of class, maybe you can see that button a little more clearly. But make sure that you are letting them rest for the 12 to 24 hours and then testing the seal. I love the sound of the peeing though, because it seals, you can hear it kind of pull. All right, thanks Chris. Do I reprocess only if it has um, not sealed and within 24 hours. But I want you to think about stuff for just a second. We're going to talk about pickles now for the next little while. What's going to happen to my batch of pickles if I reprocess if they didn't seal? Are they going to be soft, mushy, and not acceptable? Yeah. Same with my peaches. So what else can I do? I can refrigerate them. I can drain off some of the liquid and put them in Ziploc bags and freeze them top of the freezer. I can give some to my neighbors if they didn't see them. But if you follow all those other steps that we've just gone through for successful water bath can, we've really worked at avoiding siphoning, the, the chances are 100% success rate. I, I just very, very rarely have lids not sealed. My my master food preservers in our in our series of classes, we have lids sealed all of the time. I mean, the success rate, they, again, we're making sure that we're getting air bubbles out, we're following the headspace, we're wiping down the rims, we're only doing finger tight on the lids, we're, we're taking it up, over, and out. We're, do you see what I'm saying? It's human error. A lot of times, a lot more than it is the lid. Maybe we didn't want to hear that. <laughs> Most of the time, it's my practices and not a problem with the lid. Now, I'm not saying that there can't be. Okay, so make sure that then, in terms of reprocessing, you've got options, but I probably wouldn't reprocess peaches or some of that food. It's just, it's just going to be mushy. So use it up, put it in the refrigerator. Okay, moving on to pickling now. Oh, no, that's the reason it's going to lid. Sorry, one more. Um, there we go. Thank you. We've already talked about reasons for the lids not sealed. So let's talk about the last few minutes of class, um, the pickling process. Here is something that a lot of people, I guess, haven't really thought about, maybe, or, or put an actual, oh, I get it now, moment to their the pickling process. Um, first off, preserving food through pickling has been around for a really long time. And it is either in the, the form of fermentation or what we call acidification. So by adding vinegar. So I could get a pickled product by fermenting the food, the vegetable, or I could add a vinegar solution that will, in about three weeks in the jar, pickle the food, all right? So not all fermented foods, though, are pickles. There's sourdough, there's kefir, there's kombucha, there's yogurt, right? Okay. so. Foods that are pickled are going to be preserved with an acidic brine or, which comes from salt, actually, the conversion, or from the addition of vinegar. But um, they are not fermented. They're called fresh pack, quick pack, all right? So many foods can be safely pickled 
one way or another. All right, so let's look at this. There's fermented that is cured in the salt brine, and I'm going to get there, or there's fresh pap or quick pap. So when I make relish, and I, I'm on this, I chop my vegetables, I put them in a little bit of salt brine to just soak and get crisp for a couple of hours, rinse them off, put them into their vinegar sugar brine. That's a quick pap, that's a fresh pap. That is a non fermented form of pickle, okay? All right. There are some pickle recipes that combine the two. I have a two-week sweet gherkin that I ferment in my crock for two weeks, changing off the liquid and the scum and that kind of thing. And then after two weeks from that, I started the fermentation process. Then I add a sweet sugar um, vinegar brine over it to finish it off. So you might find there are some recipes in the bottle book has one that is a combination. All right, so let's look at these. Fermented, curing the cucumbers or other vegetables like kimchi. I had a roommate from Korea. She taught me how to make kimchi. She buried it in the garden out front. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was for me at that time a great easy little process to get to kimchi, but all right. Um, what we're dealing with is a control of what we call healthy or good bacteria that's converting to an acidic acid, uh, a lactic acid, and that lactic acid then is what's going to bring the pH to a place that keeps it safe, right? The acidic acid is the vinegar, and that's a non-fermented pickle or a quick pack. All right. Uh, any questions on that so far? So fermented pickles produce a tang, control bacteria through the salt. Salt is a control factor. The amount of salt is key, so you'll always want to follow that recipe that you're looking at for the correct ratio of pounds of vegetable to tablespoons or cups of salt, okay? Then you're going to store those in, we're, in, we're going to go through actual sauerkraut here in just a second, in my crop, in this brine, and it's going to pull the moisture from the cucumber, from the cabbage if I make the sauerkraut or my other vegetables and I'm going to store it between 70 to 75 degrees. I'm going to remove the scum daily if I need to. It kind of forms this little kind of a light crusty scum on top. I don't know what else to call it. Um, and then I'm going to add a fresh brine to it and I'll show you that recipe here in just a second. And then when everything is all done, my acidity is where it should be. It's this nice tangy fermented pickle that it can go into my jars for canning if I want to do that, okay? I can also store it in the refrigerator if I don't want to bottle it. All right, so what I'm doing in the fermenting process in the salt brine that I've subjected my veggies to, including cucumbers, I'm turning the carbohydrates, sugars, to this lactic acid. I'm changing the color from the bright green or the bright orange of the carrot or you know whatever vegetable I've, I've got in my mixture to this kind of translucent, olive, yellow, green. My sauerkraut or my cabbage definitely changes colors. You see the color of sauerkraut, homemade sauerkraut. And I just say, by the way, I don't like sauerkraut, but I love homemade sauerkraut. And my husband absolutely does. Um, so I've got this whole chemical process. It's not just um, an art, it's a science. There's food science behind this process of converting this cucumber, which would normally not be able to be water back then to something that's high acidity and can be water back. All right, thanks, Chris. Non-fermented then, I'm using less salt. The, the brining time is just for a crisp on the cell structure, okay? So when it says soak your cubes for two hours in ice and salt water, it's to crisp. It's not to start the fermentation, okay? Um, it will draw some water from the cubes or whatever else you're pickling in the non-fermented or quick pack process. There's going to be a step, if I have crisp with salt, of desalting, where I would rinse and put in cold water again. And then I'm gonna add my brine, which is a vinegar or acidic acid brine to bring the acidity up to where I can water that can. Okay, you'll always, actually in fresh pack and in, um, crop or fermentation, you'll always want to cut off that blossom into the cucumber if you're doing cukes. 
um, maybe salt brine for several hours, then rinse. This is fresh pack that I'm talking about now. Soaking it in ice water, again, that's a crispy stage. Packing them in jars and then going ahead and processing them for the recommended time. Um, and then you let them sit for about three to five weeks so that that vinegar brine gets all the way through your vegetable. Yes? What's the reason for the blossom end? There are enzymes in the blossom end that add to the softness or what we call deterioration of the cucumber. So those enzymes, we want out of there. We want that cut off. Just about a six feet to an eighth of an inch is plenty sufficient. I definitely go more than that because I just get, get going or not. But just enough to get that blossom end off. But it's interesting that it will make a difference in the texture of your cucumber to get that cut off on both of them, fresh pack or... Now, if I'm, if I'm peeling and chopping the cucumber for a relish, that's a different story. It's coming off in that process. But if I'm making my little sweet gherkins or my memory pickles, I want that blossom end off. Okay, good questions. Anything coming in from the South? All right. Okay, moving on, Chris, then. Let's talk about how key these ingredients are for pickling. We'll talk about vinegar, salt, sugar, all down. So let's go on to just the ingredients themselves initially. Quality in, quality out. I'm not going to use bruised, overripe, um, old carrots, old green beans for my dilly beans. I want young, tender, crisp, fresh. Okay? Not bruised. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to rinse them. I'm going to cut off that blossom end as we talked about. Um, so... I just, I say this every class. It is, it's quality in, quality out. Um, it will make a difference. All right. Vinegar needs to be 5% or what we call 50 gram acidic acid or 50 grain. Um, you don't need to know that. Just know that when you're pickling, you want to have and make sure that you're reading labels to see that it says 5% acidity. Always, not 4%, not 6%. 6% is too acidic, 4% is not acidic enough. You can't use rice vinegar. If it's 5%, you can't. Absolutely. The problem is reading the label and not just assuming that that rice vinegar, even though it's more mellow to the tongue, it can still be 5% acidic. You just have to read the label. I've got some balsamic vinegar that's 5%. So it's greater than or equal to 5% or 5%? 5%. Less than 4%, 6%. Either one can cause problems in your pickling and in the acidic content overall for safety in like a 4%. Okay, that 5% is the mark. Good questions. Cider vinegar, it has a little bit a uh, different color obviously to it. It also has a better tongue feel. Uh, it's not as harsh as a white vinegar, but a lot of people don't like it because of the color, but they like it because of it's not as harsh. So it's it's whatever. If you're turning your pickles into the state fair, you might not want to use cider vinegar. Also, make sure that it's a true cider vinegar, that it's not cider, cider vinegar color. There is a difference. Okay. Okay, so read your labels. Okay. Salt, another huge in, in fermentation, another huge deal. But also in quick path because there are residuals and residues and ingredients in just regular table salt that will cause a softer pickle. So we always use pickling salt, but especially for fermentation. So you can buy, there's uh, a number of different, well, not a number, but there's three or four different brands. There's Morton, there's Ball, there's Mrs. Wages. That's a pickling salt. I don't want it to have the anti-caking reagents in it. I don't want it to have, you know, all these different things. So we don't recommend even some of the other salts, like Himalayan salt, and just just use especially for fermenting the, the good food grade pickling salt. All right, and then use it in the, uh, the ratios that it calls for. And I use a scale kitchen scale for measuring. So when my recipe calls for three pounds of mixed vegetables, I am putting those vegetables on the kitchen scale. And 
I'm measuring as accurately as possible on my um, salt ratio. Okay, now this is where I get tons of questions because one of the big things that has changed in pickling is that the grandma used to not water back her pickles. She would just Turn them upside down, let's she put the hot brine on them, or just let them self seal from the hot syrup or you know, whatever, and call it good. And everything now has a lot of that. So, to convert what grandma did in all of her steps to water map can you sometimes get us off the of table. So, people have been frustrated and they're like, well, I'm not going to process anymore if that's what's causing Well, but that's a safety issue and that's huge, right? So, what we're saying is look to some recipes and maybe some some firming agents that can be helpful right now smith and Edwards is out of their food grade pickle leaf lime but you can again look for that other places or wait till they get some in here but pickle leaf lime is an option pickle crisp which they have i love pickle crisp it's easy to use it's quick it's inexpensive um and it does make a difference in the quality of your your pickle product so, and again, the, the, the amounts that you use, we used it in Master Food Preserver just a couple of weeks ago, or a couple of months ago in Cache County when we were teaching that up there. Um, we had some of our pickles used with pickle crisp. Some people talk about grape leaves or cherry leaves during grinding. There's also alum. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Um, and again, you'll want to use it exactly according to the amounts because alum can cause some digestive upset. Okay, so we do like the crisp pickle. There's no question about it, right? So let's look to recipes that use them appropriately at the right times. So let's look at a couple of these. Lime, oh, sorry. The grape uh, leaves, mm -hmm. can you tell me how much and why? You put a couple of them because the grape and the cherry contain this calcium oxide stuff that's in there. It's similar to what's in pickle crisp. So why don't you just use pickle crisps? Because I have grapes. I do too. <laughs> and normally it's one or two grape leaves in the bottom of your of your uh, pot is typically what we bottom up our cucumbers of, or pickles. Yeah. All right. So food grade line. I have my mother's sweet memory pickle, and it is the crisp, sweet pickle that you always want it to be. It is the best recipe if you like sweet memory pickles and lime is the key ingredient here for keeping it beautiful and crisp and wonderful um i do have to use it properly in the right amounts and with lime i have to rinse and soak and rinse and soak after i've started off with my initial use of lime okay moving on Typically, you're going to make your mixture of the exact amount of water with the exact amount of lime into a solution because it's a powder. You'll dissolve that and you'll let your cucumber spears or your cucumber uh, little sweet gherkins or chunks or whatever soak for about minus 24 hours on my mother on my grandmother's sweet memory pickles. Then I'm going to drain off that lime solution. I'm going to rinse and then I'm going to soak in cool water, and then I'm going to repeat and soak in two more times, so for a total of three times after the lime. So this isn't for the faint of heart to use lime, right? You've got to be into this and invested in the carcass. Alum then is used for fermented pickles when bottling, but it is not necessary. So it's not going to make to add any any of that to your um, your fermented pickles and usually it's just a fourth of a teaspoon anyway but it's really not necessary okay so um the type of water that i do, i thought i had a slide on here for my cherry or my grape leaves but it is two leaves to a pot typically at the very close to the body. and it, it contains basically the same um Kind of calcium salt in those leaves as the thick was just okay. Water. Do I use hard water or soft water typically? Hard water will interfere with the formation of the acid. 
um, in the in the pickling process. So it doesn't allow them to cure properly. So I make my own, or you can buy uh, spring water or soft water and distilled water in the grocery store. I just make my own. I boil it, let it sit, right? Easy enough to do, and I play me on hand, um, ready to go. This is not the commercial softer, softener that you get attached to your faucets, okay? So you do not use that water, let me be really clear on that. You won't be happy with your pickle if you used the uh, salt and the salt water mechanics that might be attached to the home. Okay? All right. Use stainless steel. Use a crock. I have three different size crocks. Um, I love my pickling crocks depending on the quantity of what I'm making to have my crocks on hand ready to use. Please make sure if you're using a crock, a stone crock, that it does not have what's called crazy. It's the little teeny crackles through the crop. So what we see are a lot of yard cells for that vintage look in your home, whether it's that farmhouse look, they're using crops for decorating. That's great. Don't use them for pickling if they've got that crazy because it will leach out and you'll literally get a salt buildup on the outside of your pickling crop. So if you're going to get into pickling and you're going to use a crop, make sure that you get a nice new, that you really checked it over really well, because you don't want that. Then you'll also want a weight, and you can buy the different size weights for the different size crops. Um, and I love these. My father-in-law, years ago, made me some wooden ones. I've converted to these. I love these ceramic. Uh, Wait. Okay, so we'll come back to that in just a second. But that's your crop. You want it to be unchipped. You want to, uh, you could use five uh, food grade plastic five gallon buckets if you wanted, or two gallon, just as long as they're a food grade plastic if you wanted to go that route. Um, and then you've got to have something that's going to hold down your cabbage or cucumbers or whatever, anything under the ground. Okay? All right. Now, if I am heating up a vinegar solution, I don't want it to be in aluminum. Aluminum is pitted or broken down by high vinegar or high acid. That metal is a soft metal. So use stainless steel, uh, or, and also do not use copper, brass, galvanized, um, or iron utensils. Um, again, there's just problems with that reaction of the acids and the salts. And not only the color change of some of those metals, but some of it can be toxic, like copper. Co co <clears throat> All right, processing. Now, this is the last part of our um, method for pickling, and I, I bring this up not to confuse you or frustrate you, but to tell you step two, or not step two, but option two for processing is really a better option for the crispness of your pickle, but it's a babysitting job. So, I could use a regular water bath for the elevation altitude that I'm at, according to the recipe that I'm using. Or I can go to option two where I hold the water at 100, 180 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes. It's not boiling at this point. That's why it's babysitting. I want a thermometer there. And I have to make sure that the heat is keeping the water at 180. But I promise you, you will be so much happier with the texture of your cube for pickling or for a fermented pickle by going to option two, which is holding your water at 180 degrees for that 30 minutes. Um, but again, I'll leave it up to you. Quick down and dirty. And on a relish, I don't care. And on some of my chow chows or, you know, but when I've got my grandmother's sweet memory pickles that I want them to stay that way, crisp and beautiful and maintain that bright green. And yeah, I go to the option too. Okay. All right. Um, I think we're about there. Oh, soft pickles, too weak of a brine. So again, I, I want to watch the acidity, uh, not removing scum. If I'm fermenting on the shriveling of a pickle, when if that happens, the cubes were not fresh or I had too heavy of a syrup on a sweet pickle, way too much sugar, uh, too strong of a vinegar solution, maybe 6%. 
um, hollow pickles, faulty growth in pump of curing, too high a temperature for curing, um, curing as in uh, fermenting um, above 75 degrees and holding in the crocks. And then the cloudy pickles. All right, am I to sauerkraut? Oh, pH again is critical. So when you're going to, in fermenting, you're going to want not, want to make sure you got that nice, sharp tang to the pickle after. And, and again, if you've held it for 70 to 75 degrees for four weeks to six weeks, you, you're going to get that pH there. But if you always want to check, use that pH paper or a pH meter. Okay. Relishes, there's pickled beans, pickled carrots, pickled peppers, pickled asparagus. How many of you have had pickled asparagus? Oh, <laughs> All right. So just know that there are so many options in this fall book for pickling, and it's so fun. They're quick back. They're easy. Quick, quick, quick. All right. Sauerkraut, the last couple of slides. If you haven't, if you like sauerkraut and you haven't tried this yet, again, you don't have to have a cough. You can use the pickly jar, a two quart jar. You can use a five, a, a two or three gallon bucket, food grade, whatever. All right. But I would try if you like sauerkraut, just in general, you will love pumping sauerkraut. Very, very easy to do. Shred my cabbage. And I like to get my cabbage fresh from the farmer's market. We used to grow our own. We don't anymore just because of garden space. But the cabbage in the grocery store I have found is drier and it isn't as flavorful. So I love to head down the farmer's market and get right home with my fancy cabbage when it's cabbage season down at the farmer's market. Shred that up. I make, I bruise it. My grandma taught me to massage that shredded cabbage in a big bowl. And I usually go about five pounds. So it's about two heads of cabbage. And again, I use my scale. Um, I add the correct amount of salt and I just massage and bruise and pound and that because I want the liquids to start getting out of the cabbage, right? Then I let it, I put it into my crop and I let it set to see if it's going to form enough of a brine. If it hasn't formed enough of a brine, then I make my own with this combination here of one and a half tablespoons to two tablespoons of pickling salt to a quart of water. Then I have, after I've bruised it, it's not giving enough of a brine to cover that cabbage. Then I will pour the brine in and I will set my weight on top to hold down the cabbage pieces under the brine. And then I just use, you, you've got a lid here, you can uh, also put on it if you don't uh, have a lid. But you also then just can cover it with a tea towel or a kitchen towel. And then just make sure that you're in a temperature of 70 to 75 degrees. And three weeks, four weeks later, your kitchen's going to stink like sauerkraut. Just so you know. And you're going to have sauerkraut. And it's, I'm not kidding you. It is so good. It's, it, it's so good. It's yummy on cold pork sandwiches. It's yummy on, I don't do hot dogs, I'm just saying. Um, but for those who do, it's yummy on hot dogs, pork sour, you know, raw or whatever. Very, very quick. Very easy. Um, you do want to check to make sure that in our dry weather, the evaporated brine hasn't dropped below the cabbage. But again, you can add more brine to it if you need to. Just make sure you have plenty of brine over the top and you'll be fine for those three to four weeks. All right. So again, I'm going to check with the litmus paper that we were talking about or a pH meter if I really want to check. Now, I, the one last thing, this is my party deal with anything that's fermented. A lot of people have gone to fermenting because of the probiotics. So when I process those in a boiling water bath, whatever it is, whether it's my cucumbers for pickles or whether it's my sauerkraut, I've lost the probiotic value. So just know that if you're looking to fermentation for probiotics, you're going to kill it in a water bath. Okay? Put it in the fridge. I still got sauerkraut from last April, so seven, six months ago. I just, I've only got a little bit left, but I still have some from when I made mean, some during the winter. Um, and it's still wonderful and it's in the fridge. Yeah. All right, that's it. Oh, yeah, kombucha. 
know that we've already talked about those. Don't get those confused. I'm going to leave this slide up here for those who do make kombucha. Um, but uh, this is this truly is our last, isn't it, Chris? I think so. Except for the credits. <laughs> yep. leave, leave that kombucha out okay. there. Okay, I'll bring yeah. it back. Um, I'm not a kombucha fan. I made it. Uh, you use me as start. It's called a scoby. Um, symbiotic, so that it's not something. <laughs> Bacteria, whatever, whatever. Um, it's like this slide here. Um, but people love kombucha if they love kombucha. So, yes. Are you open for dental? Yes, I, that's what I, I am. We're there. <laughs> Given the salt content that you're adding, isn't that a health concern? You're consuming that much salt? That's yes. Expensive. Yes. For those who are really having to watch their sodium, the question was with all that salt for a fermented pickled product, isn't that a concern? The answer is yes. You do have to. And, and anybody who's on heart medication or has heart hypertension, any of those problems, their, their doctors will tell them to avoid pickles or that because they are, they've got a higher salt content. Now, the uh, USDA bulletin uh, that you can go straight to on their website has a reduced sodium dill pickle, but that's the only reduced sodium pickle that we have is a reduced sodium dill. It can be used in all the chloride. sodium chloride. It has to be sodium chloride, right? Some people have tried the potassium chloride. It gives you a softer pickle. Um, this Even this reduced sodium dill pickle that USDA has put the recipe out for, it's a softer pickle. So, any other questions? Yeah, oh, where did I say? Oh, yeah. Yes. Are you my neighbor? Yes. Hi. Uh, yeah. yeah, just the uh, digestive ability for high acid food. That's a, that another thing is that just. Eat small quantities of eat it. Eat small or quantities and eat it with protein or a, a carbohydrate uh, that's a slow, slow metabolizing carbohydrate, so a uh, whole grain. I've heard um, for talking about. It's really difficult. She's asking about. Maintaining the temperature in your environment for fermenting to that 70 to 75. Um, if you go too hot, I can get a softer, cloudier pickle that will actually uh, produce a really gross scum that I'll have to throw away the whole pickle. So that's a problem. And right now in the summer, it, my kitchen is 79 degrees. So I have to move things down to my basement. Um, and so again, and then the, the lower the temperature below 70, the longer it will take to ferment, which again can pose problems. Microbe, microbe, yeah, not what it will do. Yeah, my, <laughs> must be the end of my lecture. I can't speak. <laughs> but yeah, that, I know it's difficult to maintain that 70, but somewhere 68, 74, that's your ideal zone. And yes, I have to move things around. Exactly. Do you have uh, the way your house is um, air conditioning vented? Can you set it closer to an air conditioning vent to help maintain, not right on top of it, because that might be too cool, but yeah, and run it, use a temp check, but yeah, run a thermometer. Yeah, or just put one in if you want to test every day or so. Um, I know, but it'll probably hold, it'll, especially in the crop. That, that helps keep the temperature a little more solid. Um, guys, pickling really is fun. Quick pack for sure. Great recipes in this fall book, but even the fermented. I, if you're, if you've never done fermenting, start with the sauerkraut if you like sauerkraut. It's a, it's a great place to start on fermenting just to get the hang of it. All right. You can get it online, but that that five pounds to the three tablespoons or two and a half tablespoons of salt—that's that's. that's
that's a good ratio to start with because if you don't feel like you're wasting too many heads of cabbage, it's an easy amount to work with in a container, right? So, okay, I have an odd question. Um, is there a way just to make dill pickle juice? Is there a way to make just dill pickle juice? The answer is yes, with vinegar and water and my dill, um, and, and then heat it up so that it kind of makes an infusion of that dill flavor, put some garlic in it, and then strain it off if you wanted to. Sure. Um, you can do that. She wanted to know how to make just a dill pickle juice because she drinks it on it. But you need to keep it in the refrigerator. I was told by a doctor that if you drink the fourth of a cup a day, you won't have cramps. And it does work. I've got the famous Yeah. So, yeah. But yes, you could just make the brine up that goes on your dill pickle. Yeah. Just don't put the juice in it. Well, then, you, in this case, because you're storing it in a refrigerator, because it doesn't matter, you can reuse the sodium on your own because you're using it for another purpose. All right. Well, I hope I'm giving you some encouragement to get going on. More water bath canning in general, and definitely water bath canning with pickles. So, thanks for having me. Turn the time over to whomever or call it here.